Ladies and gentlemen, good evening, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me. The title probably gives away most of what I'm going to talk about, but I will, towards the end of the lecture, cover a little bit about what I did while I was there and how we operated, both on the Queen's flight and a little my last five years were with uh, number 32, the Royal Squadron, at Northolt. And it's uh, a particular pleasure to see some members from there that I've known from the past. And uh, just as I was walking up, there was also someone who introduced himself as someone who knew me in Rutledge School CCF before I joined the Royal Air Force. Uh, so uh, it certainly is uh, going to be an interesting evening for me, if not for you. But Royal Flying, this year, of course, is the centenary of the Royal Air Force. But last year was the centenary of Royal Flying, as far as the British Royal Family was concerned, because during the war, it was the Prince of Wales who flew three times, twice in France over the front, and once when this picture was taken in Italy. His brother, Prince Albert, also flew with a bottle of whiskey, a bottle of red wine, a bottle of white wine, and a bottle of Dubonnet. Now, you can see where he kept the uh, tonic water for the gin, look under the uh, chair. Now, here's a picture of the helicopter in the field picking up a member of the royal family. It's the Princess Royal, as you can see. Now, behind um, the person being greeted is the Lord Lieutenant. Behind him, the Chief Constable. The one with the fluffy hat on is the lady in waiting. The RAF uniform is Air, Air Vice Marshal Sir John Seven, who was then the uh, captain of the Queen's flight. The other guy here is actually a Metropolitan Police Sergeant. And what he's actually doing there, if you look at his hands, he's taking the magazine of bullets out of the pistol. He'll put the pistol in one pocket, the bullets in the other, and when they land, he'll rearm and carry on with his security duties. Now, the first photograph I showed you at RAF Morton in the Marsh was taken in 1953, where with four Vikings, they did 60 royal flights in the year. That last one was taken in 1985, and with just one additional aircraft, three fixed wing and two helicopters, we were doing 1,200 royal flights. So if a Majesty flew, there was no backup aircraft because the other aircraft were always in use. And uh, so how did we do it? Well, it was our engineers, and I pay homage to them. They were the ones who kept the aircraft going. Our aircraft had snags, the same as everywhere else, but they would work tirelessly. And it didn't matter when the aircraft was next needed, although in those days it was nearly always the next day. But they would work on it overnight. They did most of their engineering overnight. Our families used to say, you're away three months of the year, we don't see a lot of you. But those poor guys, they lived and worked at Benson, and their families lived at Benson. But they probably saw less of their families than we did, uh, than our families did. But anyway, I think the thing that stands out, whether it's the fixed wing end or the helicopter end, is how clean that hangar floor is. Now, air, aircraft develop leaks like everybody else's, but it's very easy to spot when you've got a floor that clean. And it was that sort of husbandry that kept the record up, and we had a magnificent serviceability record of 98.9%, so 99.9%. After we had flown, we would brief or debrief the crew chief who flew with us with any snags we'd noticed and any he'd picked up, and he would pass them on to the shift boss when he got into the hangar. The aircraft were then inspected fully, and if there was a problem with, in this case, a 146 engine, they w it would be changed. We had two spare engines, and by rotating them, we were able to uh, keep going. And uh, it would take about four hours. But the big thing with the 146, although it was high wing, these guys are virtually standing at floor level, so you don't need masses of equipment to change the engine. So it was actually quite a well ergonomically arranged engine. And, of course, the cleaning. I mentioned a chamois leather and water, but if you look here, he's using a brush and a rag because if we ever get a sunny summer and it gets hot, sometimes at the bottom of your car doors get little flecks of asphalt on. And it's the same with the aircraft taxiing on asphalt. Then it flicks up. And if you don't get it off quickly, of course, when you do get it to take it off, it scratches the surface. So every day they would go... And every, after every sector, 
uh, if the crew chief was on his own, then he would go round and keep an eye on it. And if he needed some help, he'd just come and ask the crew to come and give him a hand, which we willingly did. And, of course, why was he doing it? Well, he's proud to be a member of the Queen's Flight. But it's the services, so the real reason he's doing it is because if he didn't get it right, he'd be on a charge because his NCO was inspecting it ten minutes later. Now, the 146. Two delivered, as I said, in 1986. Um, after a lot of struggle, we got the uh, delivery confirmed. Uh, the BAC 111 had been discussed earlier, and Prince Philip had actually flown on a tour with the 111 on a sales tour. But eventually, the 146 was selected. Why was the 100 series, the smallest one, selected? Well, A, it was the earliest off the production line. But secondly, it had a very good short takeoff and landing performance. And our primary role was still to fly the royal family to all over Britain. So as well as going to the big international airports like Manchester and Glasgow, we needed to get into Dundee, Carlisle, Sheffield, Plymouth. The last two have now closed, but in my day, they, they were 146 destinations as well. And quite small airfields, but the 146 coped remarkably. It was also probably the quietest four-engine airliner built. And uh, the short field performance came in useful at London City as well. It was the first aircraft to be cleared for the steep approach into London City. And if you go in there now, you still see the next derivative of the 146, the RJs, the regional jets, going in and out of there um, regularly. Now, the 146 cockpit was designed for two pilots, although on the Queen's flight, and initially when we went to Northolt, um, we carried a navigator on the jump seat. There were two GPS or inertial nav system boxes. The other one's just out of sight here. And eventually, when we got to Northolt, they decided there wasn't really a requirement for the navigator. Initially, while the crews were learning the aircraft, it was very sensible to have an extra guy sitting there as a safety valve. Um, but, of course, the Navigators Union, who I suspect there are some here, um, they were saying there's no chance you'll be able to do the timing like we do and so forth. But it's amazing. Those little uh, sort of garments of the air are wonderful, and we were able to uh, do it um, quite regularly. So uh, they were a little bit disappointed, I must admit. Um, but it was a two-pilot aeroplane, and the equipment was all designed to be used by two people. The big change with the 146 was the galley. Cooking in the Andover was like cooking in a caravan, and there's no other way of describing it. Um, but when we got the 146, we had two blower ovens, so we could take food from frozen and have it ready for service 20 minutes after we were airborne, which was normally top of climb. So... You know, it was a big change. If we went away on a long tour, we would take about six days' food with us. In my day, it came from British Airways at Heathrow. It's now a civilian contractor from elsewhere. But <clears throat> BA would put it uh, on. It would be driven out to Benson. The stuff for the day was put on board. The others was put in a cold box with dry ice and kept in the hold. And then we'd use that as we went round. After that, whenever we got further down route, we would pick up from any airfield recommended by British Airways. If it wasn't recommended by British Airways, we'd look for a five-star hotel, uh, which was normally where we were staying at any rate. So <laughs> it would, um, that's the reason we had to stay, of course, because the stewards needed to discuss the catering and so forth. Um, you understand. Um, but that meant that we could pick up from five-star hotels. If there was nothing available there, then the bottom line, which often happened when you were operating up country in Africa to a strip, invariably with the Princess Royal, because she was president of Save the Children Fund, and although the Foreign Office organized much of the tour, she was normally able to visit some Save the Children uh, projects as well. And of course, they were never anywhere near five-star hotels. They were always near the border with refugee camps and so forth. So um, we never left Benson without the bottom line of catering. You can still get them, those flat meat pies by Frey Bentos. You know the ones? <laughs> We'd have those. We'd have tinned potatoes, tinned vegetables. 
The stewards would tart up a gravy. They'd add onions and a few spices and so forth. And we'd serve the hot food to them in the middle of Africa. And you know, they used to love it. Absolutely love it. I think it was such a change from that poncy first-class food that they were getting everywhere else. <laughs> now, behind the galley was what would normally, in most aircraft, be first class. But in fact, in our case, that's where the crew, the engineers sat, either the crew chief, and if we went on a long overseas tour, we'd normally take three other um, tradesmen with us to give us full trade cover, um, or the major trades, at any rate. Um, and then the middle cabin was where the household staff would sit and the policemen, uh, the secretaries. Initially, and this photograph shows it, with the aircraft was delivered a photocopier and an electric typewriter. <laughs> but of course now they, uh, they all bring their own laptops and, uh, and so forth, so it's not a problem. But it did mean the uh, staff could operate while they were airborne. And very often on the way back from a trip, they were writing out the thank you letters already. So, um, you know, it was important that we could provide that service. The rear cabin now in the 146 was six seats uh, in normal circumstances. There you could put a divan down there, but because the aircraft had to land every five, four and a half, five hours for fuel, as soon as they got to sleep, it was time to tap them on the shoulder and say, would you mind sitting up because it's time to land? So we had these sort of sleeperette seats, so to speak, where the leg and rest would come up and they could stretch out and the backs would go back. So they normally slept in that. But as six seats, as I say, uh, Her Majesty Prince Philip, private secretary, lady-in-waiting. And then if you went on an overseas tour, it would normally be the British ambassador or the British high commissioner and... Uh, a representative of the Foreign Affairs Department of the host country. Now, that left one person out, and there was always a battle when we did recce's. It wasn't from the RAF's point of view, but it was for the household's point of view. The private secretary always had to fight off the wife of the British ambassador or British high commissioner who thought she should be in the royal cabin. But I didn't see one of them win in 20 years. <laughs> The first royal flight on a 146 was the honeymoon of the Duke and Duchess of York. And that picture appeared in most of the daily papers the following day. And along with this one, our engineers had been busy in the hangar overnight. And uh, wedding bells and uh, horseshoes and just married. And a nail plate. Um, now, the crew had told the press to look at the back of the aircraft as they taxied out and they opened the air brakes and there was the picture. The captain of the Queen's flight was on board, but he didn't know anything about this. <laughs> and I tell you me, if he'd seen that at Heathrow, he'd have gone ballistic. He didn't find out, in fact, until about five days later when they went to the Azores to pick the royal party up and they took out the last five days' papers so the royals could look at it and see how the wedding had been covered. And when he saw it, of course, no one by then had complained. So he saw the funny side of it, but he wouldn't have done it, Heathrow. Now, the red carpet, the bane of our lives, we always used to say to host stations, whether it be overseas or in UK, um, very rarely did you get a red carpet at a civilian airfield in UK, but you did at some RAF stations. And <clears throat> we would say to them, please have the red carpet out by all means. Put it outside the wingtip. The royal will come down the steps and she will, or he, will walk to the carpet. So line everybody up alongside the carpet. So you taxi in and you could see guy on the end of the carpet doing this to his pal who's got the tennis bats at the front. And uh, when the door gets in line with the carpet, never any anticipation, he would do this to his pal who'd cross the bats. You'd come gently to a halt because you knew by now half your passengers were standing anyway. And you were normally, on average, about eight yards past the red carpet. Well, that's not a problem because the briefing was clear the steps will come down, the roar will come down, and then they will walk to the carpet. Now, I was in Lagos on a state arrival, and uh, this involved a hundred ministers standing alongside the red carpet. And we went our duty eight yards past the red carpet. 
And they stood there for a little while, and I was just looking over the wing, and a couple of them broke ranks and started to shuffle forward. And of course, once two go, the rest start. But of course, they were halfway through this manoeuvre when the roar came down the steps and started striding towards the red carpet. And they all suddenly stopped and started shuffling back. It was absolutely hilarious. And, you know, it, those sort of things do actually help the Royal Tour go well because it keeps the Royals amused. Because after that, they've got to shake 100 hands, they've got to listen to a 21-gun salute, and, you know, it really is painful. Um, this is a Royal arrival in UK, in fact, at Royal Air Force Cranwell. And uh, I mentioned the crew. We had uh, two pilots, two stewards, a crew chief, and if we were going on a long trip, three other engineers. This is also uh, a group captain who was a deputy captain. But once we were doing 1,200 royal flights a year, the captain couldn't go on uh, all of them. They always flew with a female passenger traveling on their own and any overseas trips. So, Eventually, we ended up with two deputy captains. One of them, this one in fact, was also, as his secondary duty, he was station commander at Royal Air Force Benson. Um, but he managed to do quite a lot of flying with us as well. Another one was a full-time deputy captain. The other chap here is the security man. It happens to be a warrant officer. It could have been a corporal policeman. We had uh, corporals, we had a sergeant policeman, one flight sergeant, and the warrant officer. And they would look after the baggage and the security of the aircraft both on the ground once we were away from the aircraft. The gentleman going to meet the Royal Passenger is the Lord Lieutenant in uniform this time. Now why is he in uniform this time and yet and when you saw the helicopter he wasn't? Well he's on concrete and part of his uniform is spurs and if you've tried to walk in long grass with spurs on it's not very easy so they have dispensation to wear suits when they're walking on grass. Um, you probably don't recognize the royal. It's actually His Majesty the Sultan of Brunei who was representing Her Majesty the Queen at Cranwell for one of the Royal Wings parades, just as she does the Sovereign's Parade at Cranwell every year. Um, either Her Majesty or a representative goes to one of the Wings parades at Cranwell. And it happened to be while the, uh, uh, His Majesty was doing a state visit. And uh, after he'd reviewed the pilots that day. In the afternoon, he opened a lecture theatre paid for by the Brunei government as a thank you to the Royal Air Force for training their pilots. Now, there are three buzzwords about royal flying. The first one is safety, which is obviously paramount. The second is comfort. And we try and make the trip as comfortable as possible. And the third one is timing. And an on-time arrival for us, plus or minus five seconds. And we made it on over 90% of occasions. We used to operate the 146 at 250 knots indicated, which gave us about 30 knots we could speed up and about 20 knots we could slow down. You could pick up about seven minutes an hour in the air. So as long as the rolls were there and thereabouts, and they were very good at getting there on time, particularly for departures, in the evening coming back, it didn't really matter so much because very often they weren't, all they were doing was going back into London and they didn't have other engagements, so it didn't matter so much. But the ones that did matter, then they were normally, of course with the help of the Metropolitan Police Escort Party and so forth, they were normally pretty well on time. Now, safety, as I said, is paramount. So I've got a couple of slides which show that. This was the first time we put one of our helicopters onto a North Sea oil rig. And norm we flew the princess up to Aberdeen, and normally she would have just climbed out of our aircraft onto the helicopter and flown off. But in fact, in this occasion, she had to go into the Bristow's hangar to look at the video, the same video that the oil workers watch every time they go out to a rig, so they know what to do in the event of the helicopter alighting on water. And also, of course, <coughs> she had to put on an immersion suit, which I think goes to prove she could look attractive wearing almost anything. <laughs> Now, we got two days' warning of Prince William's first flight, and we sent our engineering officer and our adjutant down to Mother Care in Reading and said, come back with a carry cot and a carry cot restraint. Remember in those days, you could put your children sideways on the back seat, and you put a bright orange thing round it and clip it to the uh, 
seatbelt thing and it was stay safe. That's exactly what we did to a double seat in the Royal Cabin. And if we'd met turbulence going over the uh, Pennines on the way to Aberdeen, then he would have been absolutely safe. When they got to Aberdeen, they picked him out of our carry cot, put him in their own little bassinet, just laid it on the back seat of their car and drove off. But we'd done our bit. It wasn't long before, of course, he'd got a partner in crime, but that is actually Prince William two years afterwards doing his first solo royal flight. And he'd obviously been briefed by his parents what to do at the bottom of the steps, shaking hands with Group Captain Jones there, uh, uh, much to the delight of about 60 photographers. And there, as I mentioned earlier, is his partner in crime. I sent that as a picture to him on his 21st birthday. I won't tell you what I got in the reply. Her Majesty was very keen to be involved with those who fly her. And this picture was taken on the occasion of the delivery of the third 146, just in December 1990. And she met the crew that were going to fly her out to Marham because she was spending Christmas at Sandringham. Windsor Castle was just recovering from the fire at the time. And uh, while she was there, she sat for a crew photograph. That is the Queen's flight. 170 people. If you ignore the front row, which are the air crew and a few fancy uniforms, um, there's one Royal Naval pilot there. One of our helicopters was always flown by the Royal Navy pilot, uh, really because of the links of Prince Philip and uh, the Prince of Wales and uh, Prince Andrew, who both did their uh, operational flying with the fleet air arm on helicopters. Um, one civilian, who's the civilian secretary who dealt with the royal household. Behind are all the normal trades, airframes, electrics, engineers, but we also had uh, carpet fitters, carpenters, car drivers, car servicing personnel, refueling personnel, our own avionics section, uh, policemen, comsen, and admin staff, office staff as well as operations officers. So it was a real, everything was done, the major servicing and um, everything was done at Royal Air Force Benson until health and safety came round and they stopped them painting the aircraft in the hangar and we had to send them out to uh, uh, other places, uh, prof so-called professional paint uh, setups. But in 1994, there was a review of Royal and VIP flying. And the Pocock report actually stated that the Queen's flight needed expanding. And it was suggested that a couple of 125s from Northolk come to Benson and join the Queen's flight. Ministry of Defence then uttered the immortal words, we think we can do it cheaper. The net result was the Queen's flight was disbanded on the 31st of March, 1995. And the following day, a date not lost on some of us, <coughs> number 32 squadron overnight became number 32, the Royal Squadron. Now, as far as the air crew were concerned, that was fine because the 146 air crew came in with the 146s, the helicopters came in with their crews, the 125s were already operated at uh, North Oak, so that was fine. One or two minor admin changes, but that basically worked seamlessly. And we got three 146s, two Wessex helicopters, and six 125s. But if I go back to this picture, the front row of aircrew went over, but four operations staff, six policemen, six engineers were all that went over. So <clears throat> why was that? Because RAF Northolt had a civilian company providing uh, engineers, contractorization as the Royal Air Force called it. Um, and they almost overnight had to learn two new aircraft and learn them to royal standards. Now that's pretty damn near impossible. The company were relying on a lot of the guys from the Queen's flight retiring and going to work for them. What they hadn't thought about was the cost of housing in the Ricelip area versus the Whitney area. And consequently, the guys couldn't afford to move. So very few did. They were lucky at the same time Hatfield was closing. So they picked up 
and even better, they picked up some 146 engineers from Hatfield. So there were a bit of gain and a bit of loss. But that first year was very, very difficult, particularly on the engineering side. And there were two very serious incidents. Um, luckily, neither of them were royals on board. One of them involved an aircraft getting airborne for some training out of Northolk going to Stansted. By the time he was downwind, he'd lost one engine through lack of oil. Another one failed on finals. And the third one, while well, they were taxiing in, the fourth one did last, and they taxied in. But the reason? It was a mag plug underneath, and the same had happened to British Midland Airways, where they took off from East Midlands, diverted to Luton about eight months earlier. And the CAA came up with the idea that you never change two at a time. Well, all four had been changed this time because the RAF or the civilian engineering within the RAF hadn't got picked up the same regulations. Um, I described that first year with the analogy of the swan. It may have looked serene on the surface, but there was a hell of a lot of paddling going on underneath. But I've got to say that the guys, you know, came good in the end. It took time, as we, we knew it would. But the costs of it, I'm not sure there were the cost savings that the Ministry of Defence originally thought. Because once some of the RAF guys started to retire, they had to be replaced. And the costs of some of these civilian courses is actually quite a lot. But that's probably a general thing about contractorisation, whether it's good or bad. But uh, I just saw it effectively from the outside, and it was actually quite difficult. The aircraft we gained was the 125. Wonderful little sports car. It was lovely. Um, I happened to fly it as the examiner before I went to the Queen's flight, so I knew the 125. And that flew with two pilots and a steward. There wasn't really much room for anybody else. That was his galley, an eight-inch square sink, a hot tap and a cold tap. So food had to be really cold food, a salad if you wanted a main meal, um, and sandwiches or afternoon tea. The cabin, there was no uh, separate royal cabin. That door led to the loo, so there was no privacy. So it was decided generally that it would be the male members of the royal family who would use it when they were going on their own. If the Duke of Kent was going to Manchester to open a factory with his private secretary, it wouldn't matter whether he took a 146 or a 125. The time involved was very, very similar. And the 125 was perfect for that. But if he wanted to go to Germany for a week, visiting his three regiments with all his uniform and baggage and his military ADC and his baggage master and so forth, the 125 couldn't really cope. So then they would use the 146. So the 125 did do um, a lot of internal and a few trips to Europe, but not many. But it was a worldwide operation. During my 20 years, I traveled around most of the world, with the exception of Australia, New Zealand and most of Canada. I did land on the East Coast, as the same as I did land in Darwin en route to Papua New Guinea once. But generally speaking, we didn't go to Australia, New Zealand and uh, Canada. Now, why was that? Well, if you think about it, they're the senior Commonwealth. And their, Royal, their Air Force, in the case of the Australian Air Force, or Qantas Airlines are allowed to fly the Royal Family, the Canadian Armed Forces or Air Canada, and the Royal New Zealand Air Force and Air New Zealand. You might remember about 14, 15 years ago, Her Majesty flew to New Zealand on an Air New Zealand 747 out of uh, Gatwick. It, they took over the whole of the first class compartment. It was the first time Her Majesty had flown on a civilian scheduled aircraft. In the early days, um, once uh, jet travel became feasible, the early Comet 2s of the Royal Air Force used to take the VIPs on the longer part of the journey, and then the Queensfield aircraft would go out and do the internal flying. Once the Comets folded, of course, the VC-10 came in and did many sterling trips until it was really forced out because of the fuel prices and the noise levels. It was banned from a lot of airfields. After that, there wasn't really anything suitable within the Royal Air Force, so they tended to charter uh, civilian aircraft, generally British Airways, and the 767 or 777 became quite a popular thing. To help offset the cost of it, they would allow the press to travel out in economy, 
and uh, they would pay a fare to travel. Um, they'd also fill it up after Britannia folded. Uh, they also used to take the Royal Marine Band, which would be playing at certain engagements overseas. So they took also the, um, a lot of baggage. Royal tours do carry a lot of baggage, including a lot of crockery and cutlery, because Her Majesty always goes to, on a state arrival, the host country always give her a dinner on the first night or the second night. And on the last but one, she will normally give a return dinner, either at a big hotel or at the British Embassy, if it happens to be big enough. And the crockery and cutlery for that are taken out from Buckingham Palace. And it's not any old crockery and cutlery. It's George IV crockery. And it is loaded on the aircraft, not by the British Airways baggage handlers, <laughs> but by members of the royal household. And the members of the household are lucky enough to travel on board. As soon as the aircraft lands, the royal party disappear, but they don't. Their job is to offload it and put it on what is often the transport provided is a three-tonner, but nevertheless, they do it very, very carefully. If a royal tour is decided that it will be done by the Royal Air Force, that's when operations come into use. They book the handling agents, the refueling, the hotels, and so forth, including all the diplomatic clearances. Every country we overfly, we have to have a diplomatic clearance to tell them where we're entering, what height we're flying at, what route, and where we're either landing or where we're leaving their airspace. Why? Because we demand the same of other countries. Now, I'm going to talk now a little bit about a royal tour. And I've picked one. It happened in the 1980s. It doesn't matter. It was to East Africa, as you can see. We started down in Maputo at the capital, and then through Mozambique into Zambia, up through Tanzania, operating mainly out of Dar es Salaam. Then we spent the uh, weekend in Mombasa before going up via Mogadishu, possibly, well, no, almost certainly, the worst night stop I have ever spent in my life. Um, on through Djibouti to the Sudan. And then part of our visit to the Sudan was out to this area here, which is the Dofar region, which was in the news then because of uh, uh, problems with refugees, the same as is still in the news today. Now, the first place I'm going to look at is an upcountry arrival. I mentioned about state visits and 21-gun salutes. But when you get up country, it gets a lot more friendly. This is the Princess Royal with only about a dozen people in the meet-up group. And they had children who were dancing and singing. They had their own band there as well. And then behind her, if you look, what I call the mamas, who were all dressed in their national dress. And uh, they shriek an arrival. So it's a very noisy, happy arrival exactly the opposite from the rather stuffy state arrivals you get. The other airfield I want to look at is a place called Zalingi. Now, the Princess Royal was going to go to a refugee camp on the Chad border. And uh, it was going to take her, even if we got her in there, four hours to drive. So they, we knew we could go into Niala because that's where the United Nations were basing their relief effort with Hercules and DC-8s and so forth. So they said, can you go into Zalingi? Well, we looked on a map, and there was a little circle there indicating that there had been an airstrip there. Uh, of course, it's long before you could just pump up Google Earth and have a look at it and say, oh, yeah, that would be fine. We had no idea what was there. So we asked our air attaché, but he wasn't a lot of use because he was down in uh, Kenya. Uh, based in Kenya, but he covered the Sudan, so he couldn't help. We went to MOD where there was a department that showed us some photographs of Zalingi airstrip, but they were about 15 years old. So we ended up on the recce flight, which we were doing with the household, while they were sorting out something in Nyala. We hired, uh, chartered an aircraft, and from Save the Children Fund, in fact, and flew to Zalingi. Now there's the airstrip. And we were told we were parking under this tree. <laughs> anyway, I had a look at it. And when we landed, there were some quite large stones on the airstrip. And the Andover props are rather prone to getting damaged with that. So we said, right, could you please clear 
the large stones. Yes, that'll be fine. Uh, could you get some fire cover in? Yes, with the local fire brigade who'll come in. Um, and I looked at the airfield and I thought, you know, if the visibility's not that good, a few white stones painted along the edge would help. So they said, yes, we can do that. And just as we were about to leave, the guy who was looking after us said, uh, do you want to arm guard? Because there are still dissidents in this area. <laughs> So as we were going to be on the ground for four hours, because the arrangement was we couldn't take off until we knew she was safely at the uh, refugee camp, I said, yes, please. So roll on six weeks now. And the Save the Children aircraft has landed, and he actually operated as our air traffic because there was no air traffic there. The guy who was flying it was seconded from Britannia Airways, one of their young co-pilots, to gain experience. And wow, what experience it was flying out there. But they'd taken me at my word, look, two white stones. <laughs> and we're looking for the security. And I couldn't see anything, so I, I said, look, we'll land. They're, everyone's waiting for us, so we'll land. And just as I was about to land, just about when this photograph was taken by the navigator, the co pilot said, hey, I've spotted something. <laughs> now, I'll blow it up so you can all see. <laughs> And he was there with a, 30, a Lee Enfield 303 rifle over his shoulder, sat, in, sat on his horse. And uh, so they'd landed, so, so did we. And we parked under our tree. And there in the middle, you can just make out the Princess Royal there. And if you look carefully, this is all our passengers. It's the local defence force, it's the local council, and Save the Children Fund staff. And there's one guy look, looking the other way. Any guesses? Policeman, yes. That's the personal protection officer doing his job. And in fact, just after that, he came on board. And this was one of those where we had made it spot on time. You know, plus or minus five seconds, blow it, it was plus or minus two, I think. And he came on board, he said, you're proud of that door's time, Graham? I said, oh, yes, that was very good. He said, yeah, he said, I've just looked around. Not one of those people's got a watch on, so it wouldn't have mattered. <laughs> <laughs> but they had welcomed the princess. I'm not going to complain about the spelling of welcome because I can't read the Arabic script, but they'd done their best. And for three and a half hours, he rode around on his horse and guarded us. After two hours, oops, sorry. After two hours, this dog arrived, so it wasn't his, it was just a, a pie dog. Um, and then, of course, when you come to leave, as we did two days later, picking up, you, everybody lined up, but you cover them. There's nothing you can do about it, you cover them with sand. Now, the other thing we do when we go and look at airstrips is we have to organise refuelling, because... Uh, most of those sort of strips, you have to land as light as possible and take off as light as possible, really, but with enough fuel, obviously, to get to your next destination. We used to just ring Shell UK in London and say, on such and such a day, we want so much fuel at such and such an airstrip. They never let us down. It would normally arrive on the back of a truck in 45-gallon drums. And if you have fuel in 45-gallon drums, you need a woggle pump. And that's a woggle pump. And to get it to work, you do this. And it took five hours to fill an Andover and nine hours to fill a 146. But we would never fill up. We would just go as much fuel to get you to your next destination. And again, we would try and do it towards the evening, just before it got dark, because you couldn't do it in the heat of the noonday sun. The other thing that's very important from the safety element is the fire cover. Now, this is in Niala in uh, Tanzania. And he was very proud of this. He said it's British and it was built in 1831. <laughs> I noticed one small problem. <laughs> so I said to him, where's the wheel? And he said, uh, oh, it's on the Land Rover. <laughs> so you've got to ask the supplementary, haven't you? And I did. And sure enough, they'd only got a one wheel for that if they had four wheels on the Land Rover. So we told the High Commission, and about three days later, the British Council in Niala um, gave them three new Land Rover wheels. So when we went back on the actual flight, uh, which was about a month later, uh, they'd got two wheels on that and a spare, and the Land Rover had four wheels and a spare, and this had had another coat of paint. 
But you won't be surprised to know that that is not enough fire cover for uh, the uh, Andover to land with, uh, with the royal family on board and about 20 others. So we had to get a airfield fire tender driven from Dar es Salaam. It took us two hours to fly. It took them four days to get there. Had they not got there, we couldn't have done the trip. Now, I mentioned those uh, flags, those standards. That's actually the Duke of Edinburgh's personal standard. And uh, it comes up through a sextant, sextant mounting. There's no sextant on the 146, but the Andover uh, was fitted for a sextant, and so they fitted a sextant mounting so we could put the two flagpoles up. And if we were overseas, then once they were up, we just twist a little bit and they go into a V and uh, they'd be the country one on the uh, left and the Royal Standard on the right. Got plenty to choose from. That's the flag store at North Holt. Um, some you might recognize. Canada's somewhere there. Uh, Brazil, um, Japan. This one's interesting. You all know the Royal Standard that flies over Buckingham Palace um, or Windsor Castle when Her Majesty's in residence. This is the Royal Standard for the Commonwealth. So when I went to India one day and we were flying the Queen the next day, uh, I said to the crew chief, have you got the standard? And he said, yes. And he pulled it out, and it was the one I know, knew and loved. And my policeman was a very senior guy, and he'd done a number of overseas tours. I said, that's the wrong one. We need the big E. And I said, the what? And he said, the big E. And it was this one. Luckily, the mobile phones worked. We had half an hour before the British Airways 767 was taking off from Heathrow, and they grabbed it drove it across to Heathrow and handed it in an envelope to the captain of the British aircraft. And once BA had landed, the 21-gun salute had gone and everyone had disappeared, I sidled over to the side of the 767, tapped it, and with a big grin on his face, he dropped me this envelope down. The next morning, when we took off or taxied out with Her Majesty on board, we had the right standard, and I still had a job. <laughs> now, I promised to show you a picture of an aircraft going on its very last royal flight 30 years after it was delivered. I show it as testament to our engineers, both the military ones and the civil ones, because I will guarantee you that aircraft looked better on the 31st of March 1998 than it did the day it was delivered by Westlands. They kept them in immaculate condition. It's not in bad condition now if you happen to go to the RAF Museum and sit down in the Wessex Cafe and just look over there. The Wessex there is that very one. The other Wessex is down in Western Supermare at the Helicopter Museum down there. Once the Wessex finished, and it finished because it was taking about 10 hours of engineering for every one hour's flying, it just wasn't going to be practical, there was no suitable RAF helicopter to take its place. So Her Majesty bought a helicopter, a Sikorsky S-76, Initially, it was based at Blackbush, but has moved more recently to Royal Air Force Odium. And in fact, the aircraft, after 10 years, has been changed to an updated 767. The crews and staff are now members of the Royal Household. And there is the aircraft, um, beautiful aircraft, much faster than the Wessex. So it's meant that helicopter trips can now be done further afield, up to probably Newcastle, whereas in the old days it was really Birmingham. And, and Kent were the big helicopter bits, but um, now they do go further afield. They also, uh, they own that one, they charter uh, another one, which is sort of almost on permanent charter from a company up in Nottinghamshire, uh, an Augusta 109. Um, but nowadays, there's very, very little Royal Flying done by 32, the Royal Squadron, um, because the money changed hands. Instead of paying for the running of the Queen's flight, I think the idea was that the Ministry of Defence thought they'd get that money and save that money and use it for something else. But sadly, the money wasn't given to the Ministry of Defence. It was taken off them and given to the royal households to spend on travel. And the result was they started to charter aircraft, and it's become more and more civil charter. Uh, you might remember when Her Majesty went to... Uh, Dublin on the first state visit there, they flew in a civilian uh, 146, which, you know, was ridiculous, which didn't have the security stuff on that our own 146 had, but that was the way the thing had gone, because it was probably cheaper. 
Um, so when Her Majesty went to, on a state visit to Berlin in 2015, here was the aircraft, and you can see the captain holding a stick with the flag on out of the window with Her Majesty. Now, the next day, they were going to Frankfurt. But, of course, she'd flown out. All her staff had gone out ahead of her. But this time, they needed to go with her. So that aircraft couldn't take them. So the Germans lent them an A340, of all things. So there was plenty of room on board to do that trip. That same aircraft was used again last year in Poland when uh, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge took the children. That's the aircraft. It's actually owned by the chairman of Tottenham Hotspur Football Club. And when he doesn't want it, he puts it to brokers at London City to, to, to get trade. And that's how they, do, they operate now. I don't know what the security setup is on them. So I have a feeling we've lost a little bit on security. But sadly, that's the way of the modern world. Accountants are running it. But the RAF does have the Voyager. And uh, you may well have seen the Prime Minister uh, travelling on the Voyager quite a number of times. And the Prince and Prince... Uh, uh, Prince of Wales and the Duchess of Cornwall have also used it. So we are getting back into royal flying, but until we get aircraft dedicated for it, um, I don't think we're going to see any major changes, which is a great pity because the, over that, those years of royal flying, the Royal Air Force did it absolutely superbly, right up to almost uh, the last couple of years when, sadly, the bookings just almost died. Now, I'm often asked, have I got a favourite destination? Yes, I have. It's a place called Chitral, and it's in the Hindu Kush in Pakistan, right up against the Afghan border. And uh, I've been there about five times. The first time was in an old Andover Mark I back in 1969 when I was out in Sharjah. Um, a British army, uh, uh, army guy was climbing in the Hindu Kush, and he had a heart attack, and we were asked to go out there. Um, but it is a phenomenal thing. I used to be able to talk about it glibly, but until Michael Palin did his Himalaya series. And it was one of the two villages that played polo against each other in episode two, if you remember that. Um, anyway, he went over the Lowry Pass at 10,000 feet and down 92 hairpin bends in a sort of Russian-built Land Rover. We flew over at 12,000, dropped into the valley, came to a Y junction, took the left-hand fork, and when we could see Mount Tirishmir, which is 25,290 feet high, um, in the distance, we knew we were in the right valley. So we're flying down the valley, looking for the airfield. We thought that was it at first, but it wasn't. Get a bit closer and you can now see it. Now, obviously, if you go back to this one, you land going that way and you take off coming this way. So let's look now. There's the approach. It's at about 40 degrees to the runway. So it's what we call an exciting arrival. Um, and if you look now, that's a Pakistan Air, Air Force Hercules. If it's turned around pointing the other way, that's the view. So as well as the turn, you've got to come over this little ridge which had the uh, uh, local boss's house on the end, um, and then you turn into dispersal there. Now, we were due to take the Princess of Wales in there, and sadly, when we looked at the forecast, there was cloud cover over the valley. Now, it didn't matter what age you got on board. There was no way you could get in there without it, it being clear. The forecast was it would clear by 2 o'clock. So we were due to be there at 1. So I, we were in Peshawar down to the south. So I said, let's eat the meal that we would have had in the air on the ground, and then we'll get you there as soon as possible. And the princess said, I don't mind if we go back to Islamabad. I said, I think you'll regret it. It's a wonderful place. And I said, but the only thing is, when you get there, you will be late, but you must, must be back on time because we've got to get out of that valley before it gets dark. So we landed, the weather had cleared, we landed, and this was her first view of Chitral. And I think you'll see, well, I think it's absolutely stunning. And uh, she came back, bless her, 10 minutes early, so we were able to have a crew photograph. I think that's absolutely fabulous. She found these four kids. She said, I don't know who they are, but aren't they lovely? Can they be in the photo? <laughs> so she was wearing the uniform of the Chitrali Scouts. This carpet was provided by Buck Rogers, who had bought it for his wife. I suspect it's now in the loft, like most things we bring back off route. But uh, there it is. 
Um, now, the other thing is, I'm asked, my most memorable trip. Well, you were all watching television. It was 7 p.m. on the 31st of August, 1997. And, of course, I'd picked up the body of the Princess of Wales and flown her out of Villa Coublet to land at Northolt. I'd flown her over 200 times, so in a way, I was glad I was the one that was able to bring her back on her last journey. On the Monday night, my wife and my two children went up with me, and we laid our flowers in about row two. Now, this picture was taken on the Thursday when we went back to sign the Book of Condolence. We queued up from one o'clock until about 10 to nine in the evening. And as I walked into St. James's Palace, one of the PPOs said, Graham, you haven't queued up, have you? And I said, yes. He said, oh, you should have rung up. You could have easily come up. We'd have let you in. I said, I wouldn't have missed it for all the world. After about five hours, you know how reticent we are in queues. After about five hours, we started chatting to the people in front of us. I was being very careful not to let on. But just before we went into the front door, the woman in front said, you know more about this than you're letting on, don't you? I have no idea how she cottoned on to that, but nevertheless. The other memorable trip was my very last one on uh, 32 of the Royal Squadron, which was a five-day tour with the Prince of Wales. I was his personal pilot, and I'd flown him over 700 times, so it was nice to do my very last trip. My last three were Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, after her 100th birthday, uh, Her Majesty and Prince Philip, and then the very last one with, with the boss, as I call him. And he presented me with a lovely colour a uh, photograph of him in Royal Air Force uniform signed. And he also presented me with some wonderful Asprey silver cufflinks, which I'm wearing proudly tonight, if anyone wants to look at them later, um, uh, as a thank you gift for uh, flying him for well, almost 20 years, 19 and a half years. Well, that is 101 years of royal history of flying and my 20-year involvement with it. Thank you very much. I'll be more than happy to answer questions. Hope I haven't banged on too long. But uh, anyway, thank you very much indeed.